Well, let me change our, our topics here just a little bit because I got something that I think is really important. Okay. And that is that um, you, when you came on at Marvel, yes. you had a phrase that you uttered a dozen times to me. And it always was in the context of having a conflict with a given creator, not to mention Chris Claremont, but with a given creator, oftentimes, um, he wasn't the only one, no. but um, you said that Stan turned over to you the keys to the kingdom of the Marvel Universe and that you were the guardian of that kingdom. And I found that not only kind of poetic and beautiful, but your passion for that I think in many regards was a lot of what eventually got you terminated at Marvel was because you were so determined to stick within the framework of what Stan had created. And this is a very important point. Stan created the framework. Guys like Jack, Jack. and Steve Ditko and uh, Dick Ayers and all the other guys that were, that were working yeah. at Marvel, John Romita, um, they did miraculously beautiful stories and work within those and you created I, a lot of stuff yeah and I'm not here to debate who created what or where or why because I wasn't in that room okay but what I found so fascinating was that you with Stan's benediction really worked hard to keep that framework going and a lot of the movies that have since been made were made based upon extensions of Stan's original premises and a lot of the stuff that we did with those premises in the in the uh, in the uh, 80s yep uh, a lot of those movies are based on stuff that, that happened not that I, I didn't write it necessarily but when I was on my watch when I had all those great people and uh, uh, I don't I, I was being poetic when I said Stan gave me the keys because the fact is years before I became editor-in-chief Stan what had nothing to do with the comics he right. was totally involved with uh, trying to sell media, uh, movie TVs, uh, animated shows. Yeah. He did sell a record deal once for that didn't do well. Um, and, uh, but, you know, we, but the Hulk was on TV and, and a lot of good things. Stan was a kingmaker. I mean, he, 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 he was the one who told the president of the company, hired this guy. Mm -hmm. right? I was hired by the president and I reported to the president. Mm -hmm. And he was the only one there who could overrule me, and and you you are exactly correct. My my feeling was let's respect the will, the the the, the thoughts and dreams of the original creators. Let's preserve what's what's. I don't want you running off and ruining, you know, Captain America or whatever. And uh, and I protected it as 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 best I could, and that did lead to some conflict sometimes. And the one you're talking about with Chris, I mean, we were fighting over that Phoenix. Oh, uh, yeah. And, and uh, he, he was, uh, uh, he always tells the story, oh, Jim, Jim made me kill in, in, uh, a Phoenix. And I remember one time he was being interviewed on camera, and Louise Simonson was sitting next to him, and Anne Nascendi was on the other side. That was, she was Louise's assistant at the time. Yeah. And uh, Chris says, oh, yeah, that evil Jim shooter, he made me, you know. And Louise turned to him and said, Chris, you know it was your idea. <laughs> and he was like busted because his mentor and her assistant are sitting there. So, so he said, well, yeah, but I figured if we're going to do it, let's do it right. And they sure did. And they knocked it out of the park. And that sent the X-Men to the top of the industry where it stayed for 20 years. Yeah. So they, they did something right there. But Chris and I, even then, he'd argue with me all the time. But we were still friends. We were, oh we, my we, God, to this Chris day, we were friends. He even worked for me at Defiant for a little while. I and, know and, Chris you know, is a bomb, but but there, he was yeah, always but, oh, pushing yeah, limits. He, yeah, and he, he was, was always, always <laughs> you know, like furious at me for something or other. But but uh, but I did feel that I, I, I that I was among other things hired to protect those franchises. Yes. And 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 I I, I did my best to, uh, to do that. And, uh, and you were hired by people who were clueless because oh, Shelley clueless. Feinberg and and Galton they didn't know shit. No, they had never opened a comic book in their lives. No. 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 And they changed the name to Marvel Entertainment because Galton didn't want to tell people over his backyard barbecues that he'd printed comic books. Yeah. I mean the the the. the 
the arrogance and the distaste on the part of management about the fact that it was even, you know, the word graphic literature never came up. No. So, you know, there, I, I find some of the revisionism, I, I mean, when, when uh, Galton passed away recently, there, was, there were these accolades that were passed out to him, and, you know. The man who saved Marvel Comics. Yeah, by, by, by running half a million dollars in pizzazz ads in San Francisco and damn near cratering things. I mean, Shelley almost shut things down over and over again. I mean, you kept telling me that, that you know, you guys were dancing on the razor blade, trying to keep it going. And in the meantime, you had creators who were trying to run amok to some extent. Oh, and, a, and a large extent. A large extent, yeah. Well, you know, when I came in, um, just an example. I mean, it was, it was anarchy. It was chaos. There, there, there had been exactly one editor, me, and I was editing 45 books a month. <laughs> Very a well. Process. Yeah, and and uh, and there and there was uh, there was an, we had an editor who worked on the black and whites, but uh, uh, everything was late because everybody was kind of their own little fiefdom, uh, and people, things would be late and no one would do anything about it, and so uh, it, I, when I arrived, I, the, I had books on my desk that were colored and ready to go to the separator, but they should have went on sale four months earlier. Yeah. That there were there were four months, and, the, and when you add in the printing and, and, and separation time, they're technically six months late. Yeah. And in January 1978, my first month, uh, we were supposed to publish 45 color comics. Only 26 made it out the door. Now here, 26. tie it into my perspective. Phil Suling, and the whole reason why I led the revolt against Seagate and Phil Suling, yeah. Phil was making us pay with order. Yeah. So when you solicited a book that then didn't come out. There was one X-Men annual that didn't come out until 10 months later. Yeah. Phil had our money. Yes, and the thing is, that it's, it's like, and I always used to say from, from my perspective, not talking about the middle step you're talking about there, if someone shows up to buy that book, it better be there. Yeah. And there's no reason it can't be done with rare excellence and be on time. Well, you know, it, it just don't take more work than you can do. Well, the reason and, and why the direct market blew up after I went there was because those credit terms broke Phil's bottleneck of our cash flows. Yeah. Because we all had so much money invested in Marvel product that creators couldn't get their shit together enough to actually put out. Yeah. That, I mean, I was looking at it and, and I was a very, very small company at that time. I had three stores and uh, I guess I had just, no, I had four. Um, and we were starting to get going, but I was trying to place my summer orders in May and I didn't have the money to give to Phil. And I was just beside yeah. myself that, because I had all these books that were in the pipeline that I had paid for, but they were all negative yeah, cash flows. And, and yeah, exactly. And, and the thing is, uh, uh, so that was one of the reasons that I, we had some conflicts with creators. Because you tell a guy who's supposed to write three books a month, but he's only delivering two scripts. And it's not like he gets two on time and one just doesn't show. They're all late. <laughs> all three are late, because he's only yeah. delivering actually two scripts. Right. And so you tell him, pick, pick one, or pick two that you like. You know, let, let us give the other one to someone else. We're trying to be polite about this. You know, then when you get on time, or when you're ahead on these other books, if you want another book, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Yeah. But, you know, I can't have this lateness. Well, the guy says, you're cutting my income by a third. I said, you're only delivering two a month and you only get paid for what you deliver. I'm not touching your income. I said, but you've got to get this book on time. And so they get mad at me. Uh, and and the, a couple quit. One of the, Steve Englehart quit, but that was when Jerry was there. Um, for the same reason. Jerry was telling him essentially what I was telling him. And, uh, um, so, I mean, you're trying to get people to understand, no, that's, we have to be professionals. Take it's what, whatever workload you can handle, fine. You know, if, if Clark, Chris, if you can write another book, okay. But if you start being late, I'll take it away from you. Fair enough. Okay, and, and so, uh, uh, you know, there, that caused some, some strife. However, because I, one of my deals with Galton was uh, if I saved money, or if I beat my projections, I could use that money to pay the creative people. Yep. And so one thing is we caught some embezzling and some double vouchering and some, some outright theft. That saved a bunch of money. Another thing was I got the books on time. I got a letter from Bob Craig 
saying congratulations for the first time in its history since 1939. Marvel Comics is on time. Yeah, and coming from Bob Craig, he was there from 1939. Yeah, so so getting the books on time, meant, because if you if the book doesn't show up at the engraver, you pay a penalty. Yeah. If the book doesn't show up at the printer, you pay a penalty. You can't reserve printing time, press time, and and then the, just have the stuff not show up, and they st then they, they weren't paid anyway. And so yeah. so hundreds of thousands of dollars were being wasted by that. Getting the books on time saved us so much money, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And also, then there's little detailed things like, like if the book is just barely on time, you've got to ship zinc plates express from Connecticut to Illinois. Yeah. That cost some dough. Yeah. Oh and, yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, so I did, it was, well, I got well, that done there's, and I beat my projections. One more thing. I just want to throw this out for fans, just a little bit of trivia. Take a look at Conan 19 sometime. Um, Conan 19 is an example of a book that was late because Barry Smith was really trying to make his books super, super great. And, and I appreciate that. But Conan 19 had to go and be plated when it hadn't been inked yet. So if you take a look at Conan number 19 from the original run, you'll see that it's really, really weak um, in no, terms no, no of the imagery. Yeah, yeah, because really. because it was never inked. It's just Barry's pencils. Yeah, and, and it, so you get it hurts you a hundred ways, you know. Yeah. And, and so we got it on time. And also, I always beat my projections, and I kept finding small ways to save money. We used to color on photostats. My fully loaded cost for one page was about two bucks. Yeah, just to, for the paper for the colors to color on. Right. I find we got this newfangled photocopy machine that changed sizes of stuff, yeah. and it only had four sizes. But one of them was pretty close to comic book sizing, and the coloring is was actually just a guide. So if it wasn't right. exact, it didn't matter. Um, and uh, so I, I, my cost for a, a, a photocopy was two cents. Yeah. As opposed to two dollars. Yeah. You know how many pages Marvel does a year? Yeah. <laughs> And so I was saving, you know, the buck ninety-eight on every one of them. And uh, um, first the colorists were up in arms, and two weeks later they were saying, "Hey, this is better. Yeah, it's easier to color on paper. It works better." And, yeah. And so, uh, you know, we saved money every little way we could. We we'd save money, and we doubled the rates, doubled them again, kept increasing them, started introducing benefits, rights, royalties. Well, the royalties were the really big thing you bet. because when you started kicking back to people. Um, I mean, Chris bought his house in Brooklyn with the royalties off of X-Men. John, John Byrne bought a mansion in Connecticut, uh, uh, the, the, the old Singer Mansion. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, and Chris like, bought an airplane for his mother for Christmas. And you, know, yeah. and, and, you know, I mean, some of them were doing really, everybody was doing well. At Marvel, every single book earned royalties. Uh, you know, and a lot of them earned quite a bit. I think uh, people were making more money during your tenure, at least towards the end of your tenure, um, that they were making um, when they were working with Stan and the bullpen and all of that because oh, things were so tough um, under Martin Goodman. I mean, he was. Oh, yeah. he was no, in those days it was it was tough. I mean, I think at one point Jack was getting fifteen dollars a page, you know, and, which is why he turned out you know five a day. Yeah, and and and, and they were great too, which is amazing. That's that. that I was going to say before you don't have to pad Jack's resume. You don't have to pad Steve's resume. Don't take anything away from Stan. No, you know those guys did. Wonderful things, the great things, and Jack may be the most creative guy of all time. I'm not, I'm not saying in comics, most creative guy of all time. Well, he's uh, right up there. He's up there with Michelangelo. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. Say so. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so uh, uh, um, but uh, we uh, people started getting uh, paid better. I remember one time uh, I happened to be in the accounting office, and uh, the assistant there, Jerry Serza. Remember oh, I remember Jerry. 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 Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he said, he said, I got a royalty check here for John Bird. I hear he's in the house. I said, yeah, give it to me. I'll, I'll take it down to him. So I walk down. I walk up to John and I say, hey, John, here's a check for $30,000 for one issue of one comic book. That's your royalty. Oh, P.S. And he'd been well paid up front for that. Yeah. Because he was a top rate guy, you know. And uh, But for one issue of one comic, here's your royalty check, $30,000. And you know what? It wasn't the biggest one he ever got. But then, Not even just, a long shot. just so that everybody knows, um, two years later when you were at um, Valiant, remember when we were at, uh, actually it was a couple more years later, because it was at, I think it was 90, yeah, um, at the Diamond um, distributor sure. meeting. Yeah, he he savaged you oh, yeah. um, for not standing up for creator rights. That was that Frank was, Miller, actually. Oh, that was Miller. I'm yeah. sorry. Who did you say earlier? Byrne. 
Oh, it was burned for the. Oh, but the Miller was me. getting similar checks. Trust yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say because Miller, you had told me that Miller was getting big money, and then for him to turn around and savage you later on, I just found yeah, that to be I, just so bush league. I, um, yeah, I, that was weird. I don't, I don't understand it. That I, was a weird. I, I've never actually talked to Frank about it, and he seems to be friendly now. So I just let people. You, know, you remember things, and you don't know what the background was behind the motivation of stuff. And uh, then these things get writ large, and they're like, oh, these people hated each other. You know, and that was the thing. I, uh, lately, there's been this whole cancel movement with Stan. Yeah. And it has just, just irritated me to no end, because I knew Stan for his good points, and I knew him for his bad points. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that the Stan that was his creation was such a cool cool man. I just loved him. And, and he inspired me as a young boy to excel and to overcome adversity. And there are people who really criticize him for the fact that he was a construct, but so what? I mean, the, fa the construct that he created was wonderful. I think they're wrong. Because, I mean, I spent a lot of time with Stan backstage, yeah. off stage. He was always like that. He wasn't he was a super high energy guy. He, he loved cooks, and he, he, you know, I mean, it, it, when you're just talking to him, standing on his terrace, looking out over the city, uh, he was just as enthusiastic oh, and yeah. just as uh, uh, into it. I mean, it, he, 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 so everybody thinks he's the huckster, he's the showman. He, he, his contribution was getting publicity and stuff. No, I worked with the guy. I also worked with with Jack for two and a half years. I worked with Steve Ditko at four companies. I, I know these guys pretty well. Yeah. And I, you, the, Kirby, no one needs to pat his resume. It's, he did in, in amazing things. Like I said, one of the greatest creators I've ever been yeah. aware of. Uh, Ditko, tremendous, and his contribution to Spider-Man was was huge. Uh, uh, you know, I asked I asked him once. I said, I said, Spider-Man, who created it? I said, how much for you? How much for Stan? He's 50-50. No, he's 70-30, and for him. 70-30. I asked the same question to Stan. He said 50-50. I said, well, it's somewhere in there. <laughs> okay, and what, and fine. And what's the difference? It got done, and it was great, and they worked together really well.